mountains existed before the flood? God created mountains. You know, a lot of people thought, well, it was because of the flood that the mountains were raised up. No, there was mountains before the flood. As a matter of fact, it says that the water kept coming down and it kept coming up from the depths of the earth until the peaks of the mountains were covered. There was mountains before the flood came, what we call the antediluvian age. And uh, mountains are very significant throughout the scriptures. A lot of amazing things happened in the mountains. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, let's go up to the mountains. I don't know, there's something amazing about mountains, isn't there? Now, I know there's different sizes of mountains. You know, what you call out here a mountain, when I came out to this area, and they said, well, this is, this is Jack's mountain, or this is that mountain, or that mountain. I started laughing. I thought, them are mountains, man, them are foothills. But I actually looked it up, and, and really... A mountain, by all interpretations, is by what it's called. <laughs> That's what determines what a mountain is. Um, for in other words, in some areas where they got a real big high hill, somebody named it Mount This or Mount That, and so it's a mountain. It's your own interpretation. Well, you think about the mountains in your life, the ones that you need to speak to. To you, it's a mountain but to me, it might be a molehill. To me, maybe I'm confronted with something, and it is a mountain, and you look at it and go, Pastor Mike, what's wrong with you? That ain't no mountain. That's just a little problem. That's just a little circumstance. That's just a little situation. But Jesus, of course, in Mark 11, 23, 24, he is talking about speaking to the mountain. And he actually says something pretty interesting. Uh, if you take a look here, when he's talking about to the mountain in verse 22, and Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Well, wait. You know, I always visualized in my mind that he was speaking to a physical mountain that was there. But if you take it in context, he was talking about the fig tree that didn't have no fruit. He called the fig tree that had no fruit a mountain. Isn't that amazing? He says, you'll speak to this mountain. Remember in, in Luke, he talks about to the sycamore tree. Say to the sycamore tree, be thou uprooted and be thou cast into the sea. So there's mountains in our life that to one person it's a tree, to another person it's a mountain. And so I don't think we should be critical of each other in what is a mountain. You know, to a, 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 a three-year-old child, a 10-pound weight is a humongous amount of weight. But, you know, when you get a little bit older and you're in your 20s or 30s, you know, a 10-pound weight is nothing. But to that little child, well, we're all at different levels in our walk with God. And God is willing to help us wherever we're at. And if that problem, that circumstance, that attitude, that emotion, that desire is a mountain, then speak to it, right? He doesn't tell us to go around it. He doesn't tell us to make it bigger. He tells us to speak to that mountain. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Now, I think that's very significant because I want to talk about the mountains we need to climb. There's mountains that we need to climb and there's mountains that we need to remove. But when it comes to your life, you need to literally speak to the mountain in your life or the mountains. It, it could be symptoms in your body. How many know the older you get, the more symptoms are manifested and you need to speak to them. And really the best way to do this is not wait until they become humongous, but speak to them when they're small. Don't wait for the mountain to get real, real big. And now, oh, God, help, God, help. You should have spoke to it the moment that pain hit your back, that pain hit your knee, that pain hit you between, behind your eye, uh, Whatever it is, you know, it's like when I was a, a little boy growing up, my dad had gardens, and uh, he'd always make me go out there, and I understand why now, 
early in the morning when the sun was just coming up so it wasn't too hot, and he always had me pull the little weeds because he knew if you let those weeds grow long enough, they would get very difficult to pull out. So you, have you ever tried to pull out a, 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 a great big old weed and it's got its roots? You all say roots, right? Or do you say roots? I don't remember anymore. I say roof. You all say roof. Is that right? Roots, roof. Anyways, you got to pull it out before the roots of the roots get real, real deep and they begin to spread out. You need to pull it when it's small. Well, you know, there's some things that have been growing in our life ever since way back. Some of them, some of the mountains don't want to come out easy. Some of them, some of them mountains don't want to move. And sometimes you just got to keep on speaking to them. In the name of Jesus. He said, in my name, you'll cast out. Remember, in my name, you'll cast out devils. Well, pastor, ain't no devils in me. Well, let me tell you, I, I really believe that sickness and disease and infirmity, it, it has its roots in the devil. You got to cast it out. You got to tell it to come out. It says casting down every, every imagination and every, every imagination and every high thing. Now, if we had time, you could do a study in the Old Covenant. And for some reason, people built their idols in the high places. They build them, remember it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And there's things that are exalted in our mind and our attitude and our emotions. You know, to God, it's no big deal. Remember when the children of Israel came out of the land of Canaan and, and, and the spies, and they said, Oh, Lord, it flows with milk and honey. It's everything you said, but... We're grasshoppers, and they're giants. And Joshua and Caleb, who were moving in faith, they said, wait, wait, wait. If God is for us, he'll give us the land. He's able to overcome these things. For in words, don't meditate on the giants. You know, it's just like when uh, Caleb came into the land of uh, 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 promise with Joshua 40 years after, uh, they should have gone in 40 years before that, but because in the minds of the people, their enemies were bigger than God. See, that's really what the issue is. The devil wants you to think that your circumstance, your problem, your situation is bigger than God. Now, I, I know right away we'd say, well, I know God's bigger. The problem is we know it here but we don't know it here. We got to get it in our heart. We got to see, God, you are bigger than this problem. How, how does the problem become so big in our lives, here in our mind, as a man thinketh? See, it just, you know, it just got deep. You know, it's like you get your, your, your vehicle a little bit stuck, and if you don't know that you got to rock your vehicle out of that, that mud hole, you'll, and I've done it, man. Even though I grew up in the country, I've done it. Have you ever sunk your, I, I used to do a lot of four-wheeling up in the mountains and stuff, and when you begin to sink, you better know what you're doing because you can get it all the way down to your axle, and you dug it by just spinning your tires. No, you rock it. Sometimes you got to rock yourself out of the ditch you've got yourself into. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You know what? You get a good flow going and you get to learning how to rock that puppy just right, you'll come right up out of your ditch. How many, you know, how many ever have to come out of a ditch? Could be a ditch of depression. Could be a ditch of anxiety or fear. Have you ever, um, I know people, I got family members, they, they get, they get, a, little, they get a, a bite from a mosquito or a bite from a spider or they get a little scratch and guess what? They won't leave it alone. They just keep on scratching it and scratching it and scratching it. I had a dog one time. Her name was Penny. She was a Rhodesian Ridgeback. They were bred especially in South Africa to hunt lions. And one day she got a little wound somehow on her side. And she began to lick it and lick it until where she literally tore her hide away from her, her flesh. And I had to tape her up and get her tongue off of that wound. You know, sometimes that's what our tongues do. Our tongues make it worse. 
instead of making it better. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever got, somebody got aggravated at you and you should have just left it alone, but you had a kid? What's wrong, honey? What did I say? Well, why don't you just listen to me and we just make it worse? Now, maybe I'm the only one who's done something stupid like that. You know what I mean? But it was just a little molehill. It was just a little problem and we just made it worse with our tongue. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And they that love the fruit thereof partake of it. So he's talking about the tongue. The tongue is important when it comes to climbing your mountain. And there's mountains you got to climb. And there's other mountains you got to speak to. You got to speak to those mountains. And it says, whosoever say unto their mountain, say my mountain. Of course, we don't want to claim my mountain, this mountain. Whosoever to say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not, what? Doubt in his heart. Doubt what? That God's heard you, that you have authority, that you have power, that you have victory, that you can speak to your problem. You can speak to your problem. Say, it's not my problem, Pastor. <laughs> I can speak to the problem. See, we, we get stuck in these ditches, don't you? My problem, my headache, my backache, my this. No, no, it's not yours. Jesus already took it, amen? Well, if you cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you, you don't have no cares left. So you can just tell the devil to take your bag of lies and pack it, amen? Just hit the door, Jack, and don't ever come back no more, no more, amen? Hit the door, Jack. See, and you got to tell the devil to go. You got to tell him to get out of your mind, get out of your attitude, but you got to believe in your heart. You can speak to the problem and tell it to go. You got to believe that. Well, I just don't feel. We don't live by how you feel. You live by faith. We walk by faith in Christ. It says, but shall believe, listen, will believe that those things, Things. Now listen, this kind of broadens the horizon. It says, those things which he saith shall come to pass. So Jesus is saying, speak to the mountain, tell it to be cast in the sea, tell it to be gone. And then he really opens up the whole package. And he says, you got to believe that those things which you say comes to pass. Those things which you say. Do you believe what you say comes to pass? Well, man, now if you really believe that, what would you stop saying, first of all? Would you stop saying a lot of things? Huh? I still say stupid stuff. Do you all say stupid stuff? I say dumb stuff. I, I know sometimes I call those things that are as they are. I look at the empty seats and I begin to say stuff. And, and, and people I've known for years, I know like Pam Pritt, she'll hear me say something and say, now, Pastor, you got, you, you got to listen to what you preach. You got to stop calling those things that are as they are. You stop talking about empty seats. You start calling them full of hungry people. See, sometimes I'll catch myself. I'll say stupid stuff. I'll say, well, people ain't hungry for God no more. Well, wait, wait, there's people hungry for God. Hello? Yeah, you're all hungry for God. You wouldn't be here, would you? <laughs> There's people hungry for God, but our mouth gets us in trouble. You know, it, it says in the book of James, and it's so, so strong, it says, Be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation. For many things we offend all. For in many things, if any man offend not in word, listen, the same is a perfect man or a mature man. You know how I can tell if I, you know, even a little child, you can even tell when a child begins to mature because I was just talking today, Emmett was going on. I just love how Emmett just, he just goes on. He's like speaking another language. But I heard him saying, I could hear him saying some things today that I understood. His vocabulary is increasing. You know what? As you get more mature in the Lord, your spiritual vocabulary will begin to increase. It will begin to change. What you say will change with what you believe. You are saying what you believe. Now, we try to get people to change what they're saying, but really, we simply need to get you to change what you're believing. Because if we can get you to change what you're believing, then you'll say what you should be saying. Amen? And, and it's amazing, because if you take a look at David, there was, a, there, was, there was a mountain he had to remove. It was called the mountain of Goliath. But 
to the, to the other Israelites, Goliath was an unsurmountable mound that they could not move. And David comes along, he doesn't even call Goliath a giant. He simply says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know, there's the, 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 the di disciples, they looked at the tree, the fig tree, and they were amazed. It's like, oh, Lord, we heard you curse that fig tree, and look it, it's dead. Jesus wasn't surprised. Why? Because he believed what he said would come to pass. Now, a lot of times I believe that God has answered my confession, not because I was believing, but just out of his goodness. Have you ever prayed? Have you ever spoke to something? Have you ever declared the word of the Lord and it happened and you go, wow, look what happened. Like you were surprised. Like, whoa, <laughs> look what happened. It's like, well, didn't you believe you had what you say? See, we were created to speak the will of God for it to come to pass. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. And he says, my words, that the, the, the people were amazed at the words of Christ because he wasn't, he wasn't like the Pharisees and the scribes because they had a lot of words but no results. You know what? You can get to the place to where when you say it, it happens. It happens now. When Jesus cursed that fig tree, he didn't hang around and go, let's see if it's going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. That's how faith is. Faith is you speak to the mountain and then you act like it's gone because you know in your heart it had to listen to you. Uh, I, I've done that many, many more times than I can tell you. I'm working right now on the second book, uh, 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 Living Around the Miraculous, number two, and I cannot tell you how many times I spoke to my natural physical body and it looked like there was no difference and I just went about my business. Praise the Lord. Sometimes, you know, in the natural, it'll feel like after a hard day's worth of work, it'll feel like I broke my back. You know what I mean? It feels like my, and, and my fact, it may, you may even look at me and say, and my kids sometimes will say, Dad, are you okay, are you okay? And I say, yes, in the name of Jesus. Yes, in the name. Well, maybe you ought to rest. You're not drinking enough water, Dad. Well, that might be the case. But I'm still going to get up. I'm not backing off. Because by his stripes, I am healed. Now, I know this. If I give in to my natural symptoms, my natural circumstances, if I get, get, if, then the enemy will get a foothold in that area, and it's going to be harder to get him off. So I might as well pull that weed when it's real small, you know? The minute your throat gets a little bit scratchy. You, you know, I, I really did something stupid here about a week ago. We got a walk-in cooler, and I'm using an air conditioning unit to keep it cold. And, and, and I have an empty canister of, uh, of, of uh, R22 Freon. <clears throat> and I need, I need to create a vacuum in it, and I've got a vacuum pump. And it was open, and I thought, well, I wonder. I don't know why I did it. Have you ever done something dumb you don't know why you did it? I, thought, I don't know why, but I sucked on it. I sucked on it and pulled a bunch of Freon into my, into my body. I went, ah! Oh! Right away, the devil attacked my mind. He said, and because my voice, right away, it's like my voice, my vocal cords felt like they were swiveling up. I thought, and the devil tried to tell me, well, you ain't going to preach no more. You just burned out your vocal cords sucking free on. Well, I said, Father, <laughs> either saying, Pastor, I knew you are going to do something stupid very soon. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm hardly speaking. Father, in the name of Jesus. Devil, you're a liar. I repent for sucking that free on. Now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I command my, my vocal cords to be healed, and I just went about my business barely praising God. Matter of fact, I was speaking, and my wife said, what would you do? I think it was a day before I told my, I kept my mouth shut for a while because I didn't want people calling those things that are as they are. And my wife said, what would you do? And I finally told them. They said, oh, Dad, oh, Dad. I said, no, in the name of Jesus, my voice is strong as ever. Amen? And so we got to speak. It says the tongue, the tongue is like the rudder of a ship. Even though the, the ship is driven of fierce winds and is humongous, yet that little Rudder, that little tongue can turn that whole ship. Listen, you want to turn your life around? It's in the power of your tongue. Begin to agree with what God says. 
See what God says about you. I can do all things through Christ. He meets all my needs. He'll say, never leave me nor forsake me. He still loves me. See, you, you, you hold this, that if you confess your sins... He's faithful and just. See, the devil comes along and says, well, God won't forgive you. That was so stupid and you've done it so many times. No, confess your sins and he's faithful and just. You know, sometimes when you make a statement, bless God in the name of Jesus, I'll never do that again. You know what? <laughs> it hits you harder than ever, doesn't it? You know why? Because the devil is trying to destroy the power of what you spoke. Remember, it says the sower goes out, he sows the seed. When you speak to your circumstance, to the problem, to the body, when you speak to the mountain, he's going to come, he's going to try to convince you that what you said won't happen. But you've got to believe it in your heart, it will happen. Say, it will happen in the name of Jesus. And so not doubt in his heart, but you believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Wow, say, I can have whatsoever I say when it's in line with the will and the word of God. Now, that goes to the book of James. Uh, you have not because you ask not. When you ask, you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your lust. We're not talking about, even though God does give us things for our flesh, doesn't he? I, I remember one time I, uh, I had seen a, 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 a brand new Honda Shadow. They had just come up with them 750 Shadow motorcycle. And, and I, I, I didn't lust after it. I just kind of wanted it. And that was back in about 1983. I wanted a Honda Shadow. I had driven a motorcycle all the way up to Alaska. I uh, had a motorcycle when I was a kid, a 305 Dream. I had a 14-year-old kid. I let my best friend, one of my best friends drive it, and he drove it into a, into a bridge. <laughs> but I wanted to, I had some amazing adventures on motorcycles in the Philippines. As a matter of fact, one morning, I, I got up, and it was, uh, it, it was, spring was just coming, and I had to get to work, and all I had was my 750 uh, motorcycle. Now, the old 750 Honda, it was the old four-cylinder. They were big and bulky, you know, not like the light, uh, weight uh, motorcycles of the day but I had a 750 Honda and I got in that puppy and I kick started it and I'm headed down the y highway and for some reason I wasn't thinking I'm just talking to the Lord I'm going to work you know in, 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 in Milwaukee Wisconsin and Waukesha Wisconsin and everybody's going real slow and I'm just booking along and also I realized why as the wheels of my motorcycle spun up underneath me I realized it was all black ice I'm going down a road. I must have been close to, doing on close to 55 miles an hour because I believe in obeying the speed limit. At least, right? <laughs> At least obey the speed limit. So I'm, and all of a sudden, my tires began to spin out, and I went into the realm of the supernatural. Everything slowed up. And as my motorcycle and I had crashed by us front and back, and as it began to lay over on me, I crawled up from underneath it and crawled up on top of it, and it went flat, and I went down the highway like riding, if I can use the terminology, a magic carpet ride. I'm sitting on top of this motorcycle, and I'm flying like a bowling ball going down an alley, going to give me a strike, and I'm passing people up. As my, my motorcycle, I'm pat and they're staring at me like, what are you doing? I'm riding on the top of my motorcycle, laying flat. My engine is still running, and I'm just right down the road. I must have sailed I don't know how many feet until it finally stopped. I got off, got it back up, and took off again. So I wanted a 750 Shadow, and I just said, Lord, it'd sure be nice if I could have a 750 Shadow. I don't really want to pay. All that money, their brand new, first year they were out. I said, Lord, I believe I could believe for $1,000. It was like a, maybe a $2,500 motorcycle back in them days. I said, I can believe for $1,000 or $900. I can't remember exactly what it was. And, uh, and I'm not looking. I just said, Lord, I thank you, Father. I just thank you. I, I, I didn't have any red light, say a red light. You know, when the red light happens, you need to go, no, nah, maybe, Lord, I don't need that. You know what I'm saying? But God likes to give us good things. Amen? Do you know that, Brother Dave? That's why God gave you his wife. The Bible says, well, in fact, the Bible says a man who finds a wife finds a good thing. You find a good thing. I don't know what she found, but you found a good thing. <laughs> so I'm driving down through Chambersburg, and there's a Harley-Davidson dealer. 
And I looked over there, and they had a 750 shadow sitting in their parking lot. A set, brand new 750 Honda. So I pulled over, and I wa walked up to it, and I noticed the gas tank was dented in, and the front lights were broken up. And, but other than that, it wasn't too bad. And so I, uh, I walked in, and I said, hey, I seen you had that shadow out there, that 750 shadow. And they said, well, let, we'll tell you the story. This guy bought this motorcycle, and he went out, and I think he drove it 30 miles, and somehow he lost control and wrecked it, and he came in and traded it on a brand new another motorcycle. We just want to get rid of it. I said, what do you want for it? I think it was either 900 bucks or 1000 so I got it. Well, what happened then? Well, I had a friend of mine by the name of Dave Clugston who owned the Psycho Salvage Yard over here in Littlestown area. And so I went to him, and guess what? He had a 750 Shadow that was wrecked, and the only thing that wasn't wrecked on it was the front lights and the tank. Praise the Lord. See, isn't God wonderful? But I said, Lord, I thank you for that, that 750, uh, and I wasn't seeking it. I'm seeking God but you can have what you say. Isn't that wonderful? Do you believe that? And so he, he, he says, whatsoever you say, and then he says something important here as we move on, therefore I say unto you, now he's talking to you. See, he's been telling us to talk to the mountain, that we can have whatever we say, and then he says, I'm going to tell you, because he says, I can have whatever I say. Jesus said, I can have whatever I say. And I say unto you, what is he going to say? What things soever you desire. When you pray, not if you pray, that means you're talking to the Lord. When you pray, believe that you receive. The word them is an italics. That means it wasn't there in the original Greek. When you pray, believe that you receive. When you pray, believe that you receive. What? And you shall have. Say, I shall have. I will have the victory. I will overcome. I will walk in divine health. I will be free from this lie of the enemy. I will be free from this curse of the law. I'll be free in the name of Jesus. See, one thing you got to allow, you don't let, remember what, what affects you the greatest is what you say about yourself. You know, that's why a lot of people say a lot, I'm telling you, sinners say positive things about themselves and their lies. But you know why? Because even in the athletic world or in the business world, they, they say all kinds, and do you know what? What's amazing is they actually accomplish what they declare. No, no, I mean, you think about when they were building the Tower of Babel. It wasn't called the Tower of Babel yet. It was right after the flood, and they all began to say the same thing. And God said something. He said, now nothing that they have said will be restrained from them. And so he had to confuse their language where they would stop agreeing. Can you imagine? It's the Father's will that we produce much fruit. We can have what we say. Just think if we really believe that, we'd stop saying a lot of things, wouldn't we? Amen? I mean, don't, don't speak death over your family. Don't speak death over your children. Don't speak death over your body, because if you get what you say, you're in trouble, right? That's why we're in trouble. we got to say what the Word of God says. And he says, and when you stand praying, forgive for if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you forgive, if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. I, I think the whole context here is on forgiveness. No fruit. You, you got you to forgive. Speak to that mountain because to you, listen, when people have done us wrong, when they have really done us wrong, wrong and, and here's a personal story my, my wife won't mind if I share it her daddy died when she was a little girl uh coming home one night he was a construction worker fell asleep ran into a back of a semi her her mother got remarried this man messed around with my wife as a little girl and her sister well after we got married she didn't lose praise God she didn't she didn't lose her virginity but messed with her as a little girl six, seven, eight years old. I don't know what the age was. And uh, she, she uh, never told me the details. I never asked the details, but her, her, it, it really affected her younger sister. To this day, it's affected her. It did not affect my, my wife. And I was bitter at this man. I was angry at this man for messing with my wife. You know, in my family, we, we didn't have 
that issue. There's a, lot, there's a lot of that in the families today. I don't know if you know that. You, you can't believe how many little girls are being molested and boys. But, but I didn't have that. We had other issues, alcohol, violence, ugly, really dominating, you know, uh, all kinds of weird stuff. But anyways, so I, I, had this, I had this bitterness in my heart towards him. And uh, my wife, once in a while, was still in communicate. One day he caught up, and uh, I didn't know who it would recognize, and he got on the phone with my wife. I was so mad and so angry, and the Lord dealt with me. This back in about 1981. And the Lord dealt with me and said, you, you, if you don't forgive that man, I can't forgive you any of your sins. You understand that? You won't be forgiven of any of your sins. All your sins will come back on you, it says. So I had to go before the Lord, and I finally got the victory. That was a mountain of unforgiveness. Now, it was not a mountain in my wife's heart because she had dealt with it. She had forgiven him from her heart. Now, it wasn't treated light, frivolous, it's serious what happened, but she forgave him from the heart, and I did. I said, okay, God, if my wife, who is taken advantage of, has a little girl, could forgive, because she gave her heart to Christ and was with the Holy Spirit as a young lady. I think she was 10 years old. I said, so can I. Who, who am I not to forgive him? So I forgave him. It wasn't too long after that. He was out on one of them old type of tractors on the side of a hill with the very narrow tires up front, and it flipped over on top of him, and he died. It crushed him to death. Well, I didn't rejoice in that. I wasn't happy of that. I just hoped and pray he had gotten right with God. I don't know if he ever repented. I have no idea. But the issue is my wife had dealt with that mountain of unforgiveness where her younger sister had not, and it had turned her whole life bitter to this day. Bitter, bitter. See, we got to speak to that mountain. Whatever it is, whatever issues have happened in your life, and I think really the issues of your heart are more important than the issues of your physical body. Sickness and disease is a terrible thing. Pain is a terrible thing. But the condition of the heart, you know, uh, it talks about uh, 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 the heart and, and joy, and it affects the marrow of your bones. You know what I'm saying? So look here now before we close in Matthew chapter 7 because really I spent more time on that particular aspect of speaking to the mountains. We could speak on that for literally weeks on end because we, there's a lot of mountains in our life that we need to speak to. Really, there's a lot of issues in our lives we need to speak to. And I, I strongly suggest, and I've done it, I've got to go back and see if I can find that list, and, or, or otherwise the Lord can refresh my mind, and you need to write down the mountains you need to take care of in your life. In your mind, in your heart, in your family, in your attitude, in your motives, in your desires. And sometimes they will just sneak up on you. You'll find yourself, isn't it amazing, the idolatry that was going on in the house of God and in the children of Israel, it was constantly cropping up in their lives, idolatry. And the prophets were constantly dealing with idolatry in the children of Israel. And even Solomon got involved in idolatry. One of the wisest men on... See, idolatry is when you exalt anything above God. Anything. Anything above God. I don't care if you put God's name on it. It's still a, a false God. And, this, and so you're, from the time until we leave this earth, you're going to have to deal. Sometimes you make, your, you make the problem an idol. People, and I know they don't mean to, and I'm not attacking them because you got to learn the truth, but they exalt their problems. They exalt the symptoms. They exalt their difficulties. They exalt their sins. I'm talking about sins they want to be free from. You know what I mean? You know, some people, and I say this because nicotine is just an outward manifestation of a problem of a heart, okay? You're addicted to nicotine, and, and the devil wants you to think you cannot overcome that nicotine devil, that alcoholic devil, that demonic spirit. You can't overcome. You can speak to it and tell it to go. Say, I can in the name of Jesus. So in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, he taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into, listen, an 
high mountain apart. Matthew chapter 17. He taketh them up into a high, mo a high mountain. See, not, not, not a little, little mountain. A high mountain. Wow. You know, that's, uh, it's amazing because God had uh, Abraham bring his son Isaac up a high mountain, Mount Moriah which is actually called Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where the temple was built. You, you know, I, I looked at a map, a geo, geological map on, uh, on, on Israel, and I, I really did, you know, Pennsylvania has a lot of mountains, doesn't it? It really does. I mean, when you get into Virginia, you begin to come into the mountains, but it really has a lot of mountains here. And, and uh, uh, Alaska has a different type of mountains, mountains everywhere, but there's great big flat plains, and then there's these humongous mountains that pop up out of the plain that are just reaching to where there's snow capped all the time. But, but Pennsylvania is just a, 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 a state full of mountains. You know, Israel is the same. I didn't know this. Jerusalem is made up of four different mountains right there. But there's actually 21 mountains mentioned specifically that has significance in Israel. And, and the Mount of Olives. Did you know the Mount of Olives was so high that when you get on the Mount of Olives, and actually the Romans used it to invade Jerusalem because you were looking down on Jerusalem. But Jesus in the Mount of Olives is where he was tempted and tested of the devil, and he sweated as it was great drops of blood because of what he was going to have to do and take upon himself the sins of the world. And I believe it began to come upon him in the Mount of Olives. But here, Jesus, and, the, and, and we're going to take a look, because this is what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. Because Jesus takes him up into this high mountain. Now listen, they were not transported to the top of that mountain. They had to climb it. it means personal effort. Have you ever climbed up a steep hill? Have you ever rode a bike up a steep hill where you had to get off the bike and you had to push the bike because it's a high hill. It's a, either a high mountain or a hill. Well, listen, it hurts your body, your legs, your muscles. I mean, now they're fishermen. I'm sure they're a pretty hardy man. But you know what? You use different muscles. Have you ever gone up and have you ever gone to a, 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 a high rise and instead of taking an elevator, you decide to take the stairs? And by the time you got four or five flights, you said, forget this, and you headed for the elevator. Because your legs, here we go, here we go. And you got to really push. You know, Paul said, I pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, there is a place in your life spiritually that you attain when you first got born again. But for you to go higher, it takes faith, man. And especially because you won't find a lot of people who want to go higher in God. They're not, they don't want to go deeper. I'm saved. I, I, I go to church once in a while. I made Jesus Lord of my life. Sure you did. I, I read my Bible, you know, once in a while. But there's some people, they want to get up where they can look out over everything. You know, uh, I, I know they got a tower here in Gettysburg that uh, I've taken my daughter there a number of times. We go for a motorcycle ride, and we climb up on that tower, and it's kind of steep, you know, and, and I'll be out of breath, you know, after I get up four or five flights, you know, and, and I'll go up higher and get up higher, and you get up there, and now you can look even without a pair of binoculars. You can see things clearly now because you're looking out over it all. Well, God wants us to get into a place spiritually where we can really see what's going on in the Spirit. You know, there are a lot of times I've looked at stuff in the natural, but as I began to climb that mountain of the Lord. See, Moses climbed the mountain of the Lord. You, you need to study that in the book of Exodus. How many times God, when, when God gave uh, 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 Moses the, 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 the commandment to go in and deliver God's people, when he brought them back out, he had to go up the mountain again. And when he got up the mountain, he was up there sometimes for something like 80 days. He got up on the top of that mountain. One time he was up there, and the Bible says when he came down, his face shone so bright that they had a, he had to put a veil over his face. They couldn't stand and look at him. The glory of God. See, you get up, you climb that mountain God has for you to climb. You can't speak to that mountain. You got to climb that mountain, that mountain of prayer, that mountain of obedience, that mountain of love, that mountain of commitment. 
You get up on top of you, whatever mountain it is that God's given you to climb. You get up there. I know that when the Lord first began to deal with me about memorizing whole books of the Bible, I'm telling you what, it felt like it was impossible. I took the book of Galatians, and I'm telling you what, it felt like it was impossible. And then I memorized it and got headaches doing it, man. Hour on hour on hour, day after day, just memorizing verse after verse, chapter after chapter. And I did Ephesians, and I finally got into the book of Philippians chapter 2. And all of a sudden, I had a supernatural encounter. I ended up on the top of the mountain. God opened up my mind. And where it would take me maybe two, three, four days to memorize the chapter of the Bible, I could not memorize it in an hour. God just opened up my brain on that Mount of Transfiguration. See, so he takes his disciples up to this high mountain, apart, and up there on that mountain, he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine, not like the sun, as the sun. How many know if you look at the sun, you'll burn the retinas out of your eyes in a matter of minutes? His face shined as the sun. They could not even look at him. His face was shining like the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias. Elias talking with them. Where? On the top of the mountain. I'm telling you what, God has a mountain for you to climb. It's a high mountain. He took Moses up there and gave Moses the Ten Commandments. He took, he, you know when he called uh, 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 Aaron home to be with the Lord? Moses and Joshua went with Aaron, the brother of Moses, and climbed Mount Horab and got up on the top up there. And the Lord said, I'm taking him home today. And he died up there. Moses died in the top of the mountain. Did you know that? And they never did find his body, and God hid it from the devil because the devil was going to use it for some evil purpose. Did you know that? Did you know they fought over the body of Moses? Did you know that Michael and, 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 and the devil fought over the body of Moses? And he said, he said he did not bring a railing accusation, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. The devil wanted to get a hold of the body of Moses. You know, the devil wants to get a hold of your body. Did you know that? He wants to use your body to try to destroy the purposes of God. But you got to get up there, man. What, I, I don't know what mountains. I mean, we know that the Bible is full of the mountains of the Lord where God did awesome, amazing things. The Ten Commandments were given. The glory would show up. God would manifest himself. God would reveal himself. And there's so many things we could study about the mountains. And you need to just do a little bit of search yourself. Just go ahead. And, and if, you, if you got a strong concordance, or you, and, and, and actually every, every one of these names and, and, and for Mount Ararat, Mount ba Bashan, Mount Carmel. Remember, it was Mount Carmel where Elijah offered up the sacrifice and, and, and the fire of the Lord came down. He called the people up to Mount Carmel. said, come on up here to Mount Carmel. God's going to show up. See, God's calling us up to a higher place. God's calling you up into the mountains of his spirit, of his word, of his will. And the devil doesn't want you climbing that mountain. He said, oh, just live in the valley. Down in the valley, the valley so low. No, I don't need to live in the valley so low, amen? I need to climb the mountain. God has a mountain for me to climb. I need to climb it. And I know we try to get other people to climb with us, and we, we can encourage them to do that, but that's their choice. We got a mountain to climb. The will of God, the word of God, the character of God, the nature of God, the fear of God, the holiness of God. You gotta, there's mountains you speak to and you cast into the sea. And then there's other mountains you got to climb. Commitment to Christ. That's a mountain you got to climb. You don't want to speak to the mountain of commitment and cast it into the sea. <laughs> no, you want to climb that mountain of commitment. Amen? Now, some people, you know what they're going to tell you? Oh, that's legalism. It's legalism to, uh, uh, to the mountain of what would Jesus do? What would Jesus watch? What would Jesus say? How would Jesus act? You know, it, it, there's a lot of perversion out there right now. They're, they're, trying to, they're trying to say, what would Jesus do? And this is what they're saying with same-sex marriage. And you know what he'd say? No. That's what he would do. No, it's not right. Matter of fact, he even told the, the children of Israel, they said, well, can we divorce our wives? He said, listen, this was never God's will. It happens. He said, Moses gave you the writ because if he would not have allowed you, 
They could just write on a piece of paper, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you three times, hand it to their wife with witnesses, and then they were free. He says, Moses did that because of the hardness of your heart. He said, if he would not have done that, you would have murdered that poor little lady. They would have killed her. Well, King Henry VIII did, right? Well, that's why he did it, because he couldn't get the church to nullify his marriages, so the only way to get out of it was kill him. See, God, listen, the human heart is exceedingly wicked and deceitful. Blah, blah. He says, but it was always my father's will. It was always his will, one woman for one man. Doesn't always happen that way. You know what? There's a Pandora's box open right now. We're, the only, what's going to keep us straight is the will of God. I, I guess you probably heard of that case out there in Utah where they had arrested a man for being a polygamist. Is that right? Where you have more than one wife? And you know what the judge did? Based upon the fact of same-sex marriage, he threw it out. He said, you can have as many wives as you want now in America. Well, sure. You know why? Because you give the devil a foothold and he'll swing wide the barn door. So what's going to, it's going to really get bizarre in this nation. It already is. What are we going to do? We're going to climb the mountain of God's word. Amen? We're going to do the will of God. Well, have you ever started climbing a slippery mountain? And, and, and I, I, I do not doubt one bit that when Moses climbed that mountain at times, he probably slipped and, and fell back 20, 40, 30 feet. What do you do? You get back up again, and you climb once again. Amen? You fall down, and you slide down. Sometimes you slide down the mountain. Amen? And it's not supposed to be a mudslide. And you just lose your footing. And you go, whoo! And sometimes you end up at the bottom of the mountain. Do you go, oh, well, I guess it's not God's will for me to climb this mountain. No, you get back up. And you said, why, wow, you lying, no good, filthy, low down yellow belly devil, I'm going back up the mountain in the name of Jesus. I'm going up. I'm going to get my transfiguration. I'm going to be changed. Can you say amen? We'll give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Praise the Lord. I'm going to climb this mountain. So as we leave here tonight, you got to, you got to look at the mountains that you got to climb. You got to look at the mountains you got to speak to. And, uh, Really, we can't climb a lot of mountains until we speak to a lot of mountains. But really, you can't. it's kind of hard to speak to the mountains if you don't climb the mountains. Do you know what I'm saying? we got to grow spiritually in order to deal with the mountains. So it's really, wouldn't you say it's both? we got to climb and speak. When Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, when he said, I have not yet apprehended that for which I've been apprehended, but this one thing I do. This one thing I do, say this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. I can't change yesterday. I can't change. I, I, I can repent. I can acknowledge it. I can say, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up again. My mind, my attitude, my emotions, my response, the words I spoke, I repent of it. I acknowledge it. But now, Lord, help me to learn from it. But I'm going on in the name of Jesus. Say, I'm going on. Higher. Further, <laughs> how does that go? Uh, Billy, Billy Deck always has her husband out do it. Higher, further, farther, something like that, and beyond. Amen? Say, I'm going beyond. Amen. I'm going all the way. Amen? Father, we thank you that your word will not return void. You want us to climb the mountain, the mountain of God. It's called the mountain of God, the mountain of the Lord. We lift up our eyes to the hills from whence comes our help. And we know that you're reaching down a helping hand to bring us up. Lord, let your will be done now in Jesus' name. And everybody shouts. Amen. Amen. You can stop recording. I, I don't know what mountains are in your life, but you need to speak to them. I can agree with you, but you need to speak to them.